नमस्कार वेलकम टू प्रकाश ऑन बेसिक्स आई एम प्रकाश जोग टुडे आई विल डिस्कस वन ऑफ द मोस्ट कॉमन मेथड्स ऑफ इलेक्ट्रिकल लाइटिंग द ट्यूब लाइट वी टॉक टू द आर क्लैम्प्स एंड द फिलामेंट बल्ब्स बट दे वेस्ट अबाउट नाइंटी फाइव परसेंट of electrical energy as heat energy and only about 5% of it gets converted into light so they are really very inefficient um, so what was the solution the solution was to use uh, mercury vapor lamps sodium vapor lamps um, halogen lamps uh, which are filament lamps modified by using halogen gas filled in them Uh, but these are all meant for exterior uses where light requirement is very high and they too were not really very efficient uh, and for household use the first big change uh, was the use of what is commonly known as the tube light uh the reason was obvious um a 40 watt tube light gives about 3 4 times more light than an incandescent bulb and an or an ordinary filament bulb that we know of um the tube light itself is a little costlier um it needs some fitting etc uh, but it's far better than the filament bulbs in the long run uh, it first of all it gives you good clean white light not the yellowish one Uh, that appears in these filament bulbs when the voltage is slightly low or uh, the, the light uh, becomes very harsh if it is very bright uh, in case of filament bulbs you can't really look at them uh, the tube lights give a more spread out and a soft light um, they also use obviously less electricity uh, and last far more um, so what is a tube light and how does it work you know the structure uh, it's a white glass uh, tube 4 uh, feet usually uh, but you also get them in 2 uh, feet size and there are quite small ones also 1 uh, foot size tube lights very thin ones uh, there are also circular ones uh, and shaped in a slightly different manner depending upon the fixture that is required uh, it also needs a special fixture to put this 4 feet tube uh, it has special uh, holders at the end uh, and the tube light itself uh, has special aluminum ends with double pins at the end this is typically referred to as a bipin connection the strip on which it is mounted uh, has two more units attached to it one is the choke uh, it's also many times uh, referred to as the ballast Uh, and there is a small socket in which you can fit what is known as the starter so starter choke and the strip is first fitted and the tube light is fitted in these two bipin sockets and turned a little bit till the contacts are made it obviously works on ac it uh, flickers a little bit and then starts and once it starts it gives you continuous white light uh, continuous in a slightly different sense because the frequency of that light is 50 hertz and we feel that it is continuous there are some small toys that are available if you turn them in the tube light uh, light that is given you can see designs and patterns on it uh, stroboscopic ones uh, that is more because of this flickering uh, 50 hertz flickering i'll talk of this sometime later um and then these tube lights uh, even if they are switched off sometimes seem to glow uh, in the dark uh, there are some problems and then this happens uh, i'm not going to come to that right now uh, the science and the concept as to how the tube lights were made is pretty old uh 1856 is the time when a german scientist called uh, geisler uh, explained the concept of how light could be obtained in this particular manner uh, so sometimes these tube lights are also called as geisler tubes 
uh, that is only if, uh, in the scientific field where people know about it. And what he used was a very high voltage which is typically referred to as high tension. Um, he filled the glass tube with uh, uh, a gas like carbon dioxide or nitrogen or nitrogen and it was at low pressure it applied an extremely high voltage and uh, this resulted into a glow in the tube uh, the glass tube itself uh, and this it was a pretty weak light. Then they tested out with things like mercury and sodium and the neon signs that I am going to talk of them a little bit later on. So, all this was a development at that time, but the light was extremely weak. Uh, it was not really very good enough till uh, something that we talked of last time the tungsten filament came in and then uh, there was a person uh, named Crompton who was working in uh, General Electrics and uh, he is the one who is credited in 1934 sometime he is credited with the original concepts of getting that uh, structure made up. Uh, to form what is today we talk of as the tube light. Um, naturally, uh, there were some industries that started and developed a lot of things related to it. We, the, the companies that we know of associated with tube lights, uh, Crompton itself, General Electric, Sylvania, all these are the people who, uh, who initially worked on the same area and developed uh, this concept to its perfection so that it could be brought uh, forward to the common man. So, they what they finally came up with was a was a tube of a particular length standardized because it had to be produced in mass uh, the 4 feet and uh, occasionally later on 2 feet also were made. Um, it has low pressure inside uh, it is uh, 0 0.3 percent that means uh, 3 upon 10,000 of, of the original atmospheric pressure. Um, also, there are noble gases put inside. People from chemistry will know what noble gases are, but uh, you must have heard of the words basically uh, they are neon or xenon or uh, argon or krypton gas. These are all, uh, of course, helium is one of them, but that is not used. Uh, usually, uh, argon or krypton is filled in, and uh, these noble gases are present. Along with it, there is a small amount of mercury vapor actually mercury is put inside and then it vaporizes because the pressure is pretty low. Then the glass tube itself from inside is coated with a material that is known as phosphor. It is a phosphor coating the white coating that is given from inside throughout the tube light. A phosphor is a material that tends to glow uh, uh, under certain conditions uh, when, when suitable energy is provided to it, it begins to glow is another phenomenon called fluorescence and phosphorescence. These are two slightly different things. Here what are we are using is phosphorescence. Uh, the coating what is it? Uh, you should I am just giving you the names um, uh, calcium tungstate is used, zinc silicate and calcium borate. These are all mixed together in powder form and that mixture is a whitish mixture that is coated from inside in this glass tube. So, if you have seen a broken glass tube uh, a tube light and you would find that coating inside. Uh, at the two ends there are two filaments the tungsten filament is the first step that I told you of this, but uh, the tungsten filament is not enough. So, what is done is this filament itself is coated with certain material uh, it could be uh, barium or strontium or uh, calcium oxide. Uh, the reason for coating it in this particular manner is then when it when the filament gets hot it starts this coating helps it to uh, emit electrons at high temperature uh, which starts moving through the tube. This particular phenomenon has a particular name it is known as therm ionic emission. The, the effect is emission of ions which are basically electrons due to heat because therm ionic emission it is a very important pheno phenomenon in science because uh, uh, that is how valves 
started you remember your old radios valve radios and so forth and and the starting point of electronics is with this thermionic emission how valves were made in the beginning uh, so these electrons are emitted thermions are elected and these electrons are expected to travel to the other end and uh, they wouldn't they would get neutralized if there was too much of air or other material that is why it has to be evacuated or under very low pressure and the noble gases that are added on ensure that the electrons travel to a much larger distance without neutralizing <coughs> so that there is a greater chance of their colliding with the mercury vapor that is uh, around so the mer mercury atoms that are around <coughs> and because of this uh, something that i mentioned last time the 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 mercury atoms get excited and their electrons go to a higher level they can't stay there so they come down and when they come down they emit all that excess amount of energy in the form of a photon the word photon actually means a light particle and that's nothing but the light that we see and this particular photon its wavelength will depend upon the height through which it has come down as far as mercury is concerned this uh, emitted light is in the ultraviolet region so the electrons undergo transition because of collision of the i'm sorry the electrons in mercury undergo transition because of the colliding electrons and they start emitting ultraviolet light this ultraviolet light falls on the phosphor coating that is inside and excites these phosphor electrons to their higher levels but when these phosphor electrons come back to their original levels their energy difference which is typically referred to as energy gap is lower so naturally they give out an light of lesser energy than uv and ultraviolet and that is in the visible range so the complete coating begins to glow as white light and that white light is the light that we get from the tube light that's not all there's some more issue inside uh, i told you that geisler had used very high voltage to start off that process of uh, electron conduction and um, that's what resulted into the glow but we have only 220 volt or uh, 110 volt in other some countries how is it going to work so that is why you need that uh, choke which is known as the ballast and the starter this is a little technical but uh, i'll clarify how this works out uh, let me put it in a very simple form suppose uh, i'm supplying 220 volt and what i have inside is the choke coil which is nothing but a very high number of turns coil uh, which typically works on the principle of induction and what happens is whenever current through it fluctuates to a small extent it develops an opposing effect and an opposing voltage but there is another part inside which is the uh, starter uh, that's also like a very small glass capsule which has uh, two terminals and uh, if you see a slightly cheaper version of a starter you can see that actually it glows when the when the tube light is switched on now let me put talk in terms of a slightly different set of numbers um, the equations i won't go into details this l di by dt and so forth Let, let's keep that aside um, i have 220 volts so in the circuit what i must also have is 220 volt which is the one that is going to be applied across the tube light but because of this uh, induction coil what actually happens is at the circuit develops an extremely high reverse voltage maybe about uh, i let's take an example let's say 2000 volts and uh, the other side develops a very high there is a small capacitor which develops a correspondingly opposite voltage of plus 2000 volts and that is the one that triggers the spark plug to uh, the the rather the uh, starter to trigger on and 
cause a glow inside. So see what has happened. 220 is equal to plus 2000 minus 2000 and 220 volts. The instant this happens, the starter begins to glow and because of the energy of that, there is a bimetallic strip inside which touches. As soon as that happens, it shorts and the result is that uh, the voltage across it disappears. So, what happens to that very high voltage that was developed across the choke? That goes to the tube light and that is strong enough to cause not only the emission of electrons from the coil that is inside, but also the electrons to cause a discharge in the tube. And so, the thermions begin to move and the rest of the process they collide with the hydro the mercury atoms and the rest of the transitions and white light begins to come out. Once this happens, once the gas inside gets ionized, it does not need all that 2000 volt uh, to start off. So, the starter is the one that is kicking off the process that is why the starter. So, you can actually see it flickering as it tries to establish that ionization in the tube and once that starts off the starters function is over because it is just a starter. So, actually once the tube light begins to work you can in fact remove the starter and the tube light will continue to work. But if you remove the starter, switch it off and try to start again, it will not work because the initial requirement of inner overcoming the ionization potential is not there. So, unless the starter is there, the tube light is not going to start, but once it starts you do not need the starter. That is how a tube light works and it functions. The phosphor is the one that really emits the white light, but the UV energy is much higher than the energy emitted by the phosphors. So, what happens to the remaining energy? It is absorbed by the phosphor as heat. Also that choke that is inside that block that is there on top of the tube light that also gets hot and the sparking that is taking place inside that is also causing loss of energy. So, overall more than half the energy is lost in the heat and other process, but still the amount of white light that comes out of the tube light is roughly 3 to 4 times more than a corresponding bulb with a filament that would have given out light. So, if I use a, a 40 watt tube light and a 40 watt bulb incandescent bulb, the tube light would give about 3 to 4 times more amount of light and that is how tube lights work, work sometimes fail also and when a tube light fails, how do you know that a tube light fails, it just stops working, what happens? Either the starter has gone bad, where because of the sparking the two very small points inside have got damaged or the electrons that are being emitted by the two electro, the, the electrode at the ends causing the flow of electrons have started heating up so much that the coatings have started disappearing and that you can notice by the black patch that you see at the end of the tube lights. So, you look at the tube light and say oh this is this is gone black at the ends and um, this is not going to work. So, first step you do is if it is not black you replace the starter and usually the, it starts off or you find that it is still not starting it obviously means that the, the, the coating and the, the thermions that are being emitted are not good enough and you have to replace. But the lifetime of such a tube light is at least 10 times more than an ordinary filament bulb, average filament bulb. That is why tube lights are far more efficient, far more better. They, they are, they are, the problem is not just the light that comes out, the heat loss is less. So, naturally the electrical bills are going to be less, 
and the light coming out is more soothing and more comfortable and it is closer to the natural bright white light that we see. If the voltage in the house fluctuates a filament bulb will go, go dim and become yellowish whereas a tube light will give you the typical white light that we see. Were there some problems? Yes, obviously. Um, fitting up all that fixture and that choke and the starter and all that was not really very convenient. So, they tried to put everything together in a small compact unit and that is compact fluorescent lamps or CFLs where the circuit uh, required to start off the process is slightly different than uh, the starter, uh, but that is built in in that round hollow or the hollow cavity below and the tube itself is much smaller and thinner and is folded around and clamped on or fixed inside this holder and the terminals are the ones that can be fitted into any bulbs holder. So, the advantage is clear you do not need all that structure you just take it out and put it in and that is the CFL that we talk of. So, it was just an improvement, but once it gets bad the whole thing has to be thrown off. Some of them have a facility of removing those glass capsules and replacing them with the new ones, but before all that could become very popular more uh, important developments took place which I am going to come to later on. There is one more thing that happened along with this. <coughs> and these discharge tubes, Geisler tubes or the tube lights got modified uh, along a slightly different scientific path and um, they came about in the form of what we know as neon signs. That is also a cold cathode uh, gas discharge. Uh, it needs uh, basic working is very similar to the tube light that I talked of, uh, but there is only uh, one ch major change inside at low pressure you have neon gas that is filled and it is not like mercury. So, uh, its electrons jump up and down in the process of collision through only one particular distance or one particular energy difference and so naturally it can give out only one type of photons or only one wavelength of photons and such light is only of one color. Typically the neon color that we see uh, orange uh, reddish orange color that you see of neon signs. Such light is typically referred to as monochrome light. So, neon signs are monochromatic light sources and uh, these glass tubes uh, because of the skill of humans could be bent around in any particular shape and you could make letters out of it and so forth and what you have then is the neon signs that we talk of a written form including ideas such, such as signatures could be made out of all this and complex letters of various scripts could be made. Then they realized I use neon replace it with something else if you use a different element the level difference of electrons is different. So, naturally the monochromatic light that comes out is of a different wavelength of different color. So, if you put hydrogen in the tube you get red light and if you put helium you get yellow and if you put carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide is carbon, oxygen, oxygen and the combination. So, naturally more number of wavelengths so it gives out white light. If you put mercury you get blue light actually you tend to get ultraviolet, but ultraviolet is even more energetic than blue. So, a part of it is in blue region. So, it tends to give you bluish shade and what if you use a mixture of gases if you mix argon and helium you start getting the gold shade in these signs. Then they realize that why use an ordinary direct plain glass tube use the glass tube itself which is colored. So, if the glass tube is yellow and if you have a different gas inside it will emit a different color. 
so you could have a blue light coming out of a yellow and you would have a combination of yellow and blue coming out or you could have red and yellow and get another shade and you could have blue and yellow which typically would tend to give you greenish shade and so forth so a combination of the glass and the gas inside gave rise to a variety of different shades that could be obtained in these neon signs generally they are all called neon signs but we must remember that it's not always neon gas inside there could be other gases also and that's how then first the geisler tube then one branch going towards the neon signs and the second one to what we use at home or were used to using at home for a very long time throughout india the tube light but things changed science tends to improve things and the next step was to talk of leds or light emitting diodes that's something that we will talk of next time because that's a very important area for for us everybody who's interested in talking of intelligent things must know what these new technologies and new things are if you have appreciated whatever i have talked of understood the basic concepts of how tube light works please pass on this information to your friends every time you look at a tube light understand how it really works tell your friends about this like and subscribe to this channel till we meet again after 15 days to talk of the next major area in this set of concepts associated with electricity i'm prakash jog saying namaskar